Welcome to this new video lecture for the course Multimodal Communication. This is the third of five video lectures introducing the concept and research area of multimodality. So far we've discussed what multimodality is and where in which disciplines it originate. This lecture now mainly summarizes the content of chapter 3 of the underlying textbook and introduces first important key terms for your research and analysis. The, aims, the aim of this lecture is therefore to define several key terms and to support with these key terms your actual analysis of all kinds of multimodality in use. This means then that these definitions will not only give you theoretical and abstract concepts, but clear and manageable steps and tools to actually do and perform analysis. We will start very broadly with the notion and concept of communication and then move on to define the media with which and in which multimodal communication takes place. We see this concept as so important that we will only come to the definition of modes in one of our next lectures. Whenever we looked at more concrete examples so far, we always addressed the whole situation in which media and expressive forms play a role. We looked, for example, at this moment where two people have a video conference or follow a video lecture, and we discussed in which situation these two colleagues on the right are. If we now also look at other places or moments in which multimodality plays a role, we should and will always think about the communicative situation of each moment before we discuss the expressive forms in media. So, Browsing through a newspaper's website and the information available in different forms is as much a communicative situation as reading a printed newspaper. The media, as well as the expressive forms involved, are of course partly different. And in order to be able to distinguish between these different forms and media, it is important to describe and characterize the communicative situation first. This is then exactly following our definition of multimodality that we gave in our first lecture. Multimodality is a way of characterizing communicative situation which rely upon combinations of different forms of communication to be effective. But what is a communicative situation exactly? And how do we define it properly to be a basis for multimodal analysis? In chapter 3 of our book, we give three necessary conditions or features for and of a communicative situation. We work with these conditions in order to avoid stuff to be seen as communicative, which actually isn't communicative in the sense of gaining something out of it. When we read the news or watch a series online, we gain information and entertainment by creating meaning out of the stuff we are seeing. We can create meaning out of all sorts of things and signs, but we need this stuff to be a bit more systematic to have it as an analytical approach to multimodality. What we define as a first necessary condition that the stuff carries some semiotic activity in the form of material regularities. This is set under point one here. We explain this with the help of a pebble that we find at a beach. This pebble might show traces of its origin and the natural influences it, had, it has experienced, such as erosions of wind and water, for example. And these traces might even be classified as signs by some people. But in fact, these signs only explain why they are there and they do not carry any further meaning. They are natural signs, if you want but there are no communicative acts that are designed or produced so that someone can gain something out of them. The situation is different when you find a pebble such as the right one here, which is marked with a cross scratched into it. The fact that we see some marks that have not just been added naturally, but deliberately, probably by someone with a clear idea of it, gives us a strong cue that some sort of communication was intended here. According to the semiotician Charles Sanders Peirce, we would call this type of sign an indexical sign that points us towards something else by virtue of a causal connection. 
The cross on the pebble is then indexical of a certain communicative situation that we cannot see anymore. And this is exactly the problem here. With this cross marked on the pebble, we see some communicative intention, but we do not know in what kind of situation this cross was placed. We are not in this communicative situation. This means that we do not know either what exactly the sign is that is intended to communicate. Is it the cross itself and only the cross? Is it perhaps the combination of the cross with the color of the pebble? Is it the cross on the pebble at exactly the place where we found the pebble at the beach? Or something else? What is missing here is the information about the physical property that is used to produce the communication. We only have an indication that some sign producer wanted to communicate something to someone but we do not know what and how they wanted to communicate. We call these physical properties the material regularities of the semiotic activity. We do not know who, in which situation, for what purpose, put the cross on the pebble, and so we do not know anything about the regularities this sign producer used. And we can only guess what the cross should mean. This leads us to the second and third condition we define for a communicative situation. Knowing that some material regularities are used to carry semiotic activity must be a shared knowledge in a community of users. This means that by using a cross on a pebble to communicate a certain message to someone else, we must be sure that some others, the recipients of this message, are able to understand what and how we communicate. We usually take this shared knowledge for granted when we choose a certain language to communicate to others, because we assume that the recipients of our communication in a certain situation speak our language. A community of users is thus, for example, the speakers of the Dutch language. Another community of users could be the YouTube community, which has developed certain conventions and styles when communicating with each other in the video and comments, for example. They all share a certain knowledge about these conventions and the resources and regularities available to use the medium. The knowledge in this group might be distributed unequally amongst the users. Being a newbie on YouTube, for example, one might not know much about how to use the resources to modify a video, add subtitles or links, how to get a video listed prominently, or how to use a good thumbnail image. While others, might be experts and influencers that are able to use every single option available for their specific purposes. Within this general knowledge, there should thus also be a specific knowledge about how to use the material regularities and turn them into some sort of interpretation, or rather meaning. This is the third condition mentioned here. For a communicative situation, this means that only with this specific knowledge, the scheme to derive interpretations, the recipients in this interpretation are able to see or understand what is often called the intention, or more precisely, that which was intended. This is then exactly what is missing in the situation at the beach, where we don't know and cannot find any scheme to interpret the intention for the cross on the pebble. And then the pebble with the cross is just not fulfilling all requirements for the communicative situation we define here. Media artifacts, such as the ones we've been looking at here, normally occur in situations where a scheme to interpret them is available for the group of users. We are able to address tweets, Facebook postings, emails, TV series on Netflix as multimodal artifacts embedded in a specific communicative situation and we are able to interpret them, normally, successfully. And this is then what we're going to do for every multimodal analysis from now on. We will first be defining and describing the communicative situation in which we find this artifact or the performance before we think about the interpretation. For the definition of the communicative situation, we will look at the sign makers, so the producers of and contributors to the multimodal artifact or performance. We will look at the sign consumers, those who are receiving and interpreting the artifact. 
And most importantly, we will look at the materialities and material regularities, what we call from now on the canvas, in which or on which the sign makers are working. Canvas here is a technical term for all things that may carry meaning, or as we say in the book, for anything where we can inscribe material regularities that may then be perceived and taken up in interpretation. And this is regardless of whether it is an actual, virtual or simply produced canvas, whether it is performed physically in time or a result of a complex technological process. We define a canvas as the locus or place of semiotic activity, presenting the interface that the medium provides for the interpreters of the messages that the medium carries. A canvas is thus the place where meaning construction is happening. And with this, it is a very prominent and important aspect of multimodal analysis. A precise description of the canvas allows us to find out more about how different materialities in the different media, and in our daily life, of course, support different kinds of communicative situations. By looking closely at the canvases of each communicative situation, we will then find out what could be done with the materiality. And this in turn will teach us how to interpret how and for which purpose the material is being used. So, as an example, by looking at how this video lecture uses different materialities on its canvas, its di digital surface if you want, you learn at the same time how to construct meaning from this video, how to understand what is being said, and you probably also learn how to build your own video of a presentation. It is important to note that the concept of the canvas is a rather abstract one that allows us to define the analytical focus for our multimodal analysis. We do this for each communicative situation in order to say more about the relationship between the material being used to construct meaning and the participant of this communicative situation. In the book, we discuss several typical canvases for a variety of multimodal communicative situations. There is, for example, the context of a face-to-face -face interaction that we've already described several times now as one of the most complex situations. In such a situation, interactants of a certain speech community, for example, those of the Dutch language, come together and talk to each other. Some of them must ju might just be listening, what others actively use spoken language, intonation, gestures, maybe also body movements to communicate. The canvas of this communicative situation is the complete physical situation in which the interaction takes place, which is then constituted not only by the verbal utterances and facial expressions, but also by the settings, objects and environments. What we can then say about this canvas is that it is symmetric and dynamic. And here we start using the vocabulary and concepts we introduce in chapter three of the textbook. The canvas of a face-to-face -face interaction is symmetric, dynamic and transient. This means that the situation is changing again and again due to the various contributions of the speakers and listeners. These contributions may take a while, but they are not remaining in the situation. And the situation thus changes over time and is not static, of course. Here is a first overview of the basic material dimensions we describe for each communicative situation. On the basis of time, we generally distinguish between static and dynamic artifacts or performances that are either two or three dimensional. It is important here that this is a description of the properties of the material and not of what is depicted in the material. A flat screen showing a natural landscape is still only two-dimensional, even though it is showing a three-dimensional environment. The material also regulates the transients of a communicative situation. It is either permanent or fleeting. And depending on the role the sign consumer in the artifact or performance has, we distinguish between participants that are most likely involved in some sort of communication on the canvas, and observers that are more distant and externalized. 
Look, for example, at this comic page, which is a totally different artifact than the dynamic situation of a face-to-face -face interaction. We can first of all think about how such a comic page is usually, usually received or read. Some kids could, for example, be looking at this page together and talking about it, which would be a bit similar to a face-to-face -face interaction. From a multimodal perspective, though, the artifact and the page as a whole, without any readers involved, is already an interesting object of analysis by itself. In order to then analyze the comic page multimodally, we approach the canvas as an asymmetric static artifact. There is no change over time, for or in the material regularities, and the page itself on printed paper or even as a digital image file cannot change. It is therefore permanent. What we as recipients have to do, however, is to construct the story told in this comic, and with this also construct temporal sequences of events that are shown in the panels, for example. These panels are placed on a page, thus in a spatial arrangement, which is a non-linear organization, and which we often call layout. The same is true for a film that tells a story, and that may create the story with all sorts of images put together to show a certain time period. In contrast to a comic page, however, a film is dynamic, because it uses moving images and dynamic animations, for example, to create meaning. Since these images are put together in a sequence, and thus a linear order, we also describe the canvas as linear. Both comics and film usually work with more complex arrangements such as certain table grids on the page or split screens or other camera techniques for the audiovisual artifact. And they all require some work to be understood and interpreted. We characterize such depictions and materialities as microergodic, since the composition of these artifacts needs to be constructed during the reception. The term ergodic was originally used by Espen Arthes to describe literature in which the reader has to do work to select or make the interpretation paths that they follow. We build on this term for all multimodal artifacts whenever a user or reader or viewer of a text has to participate in the artifact in order to construct the text that is emerging from the communicative situation. And we then categorize the ergodic according to the type of work the user or reader has to do. Whenever there is some sort of composition necessary, for example with the panels on a comic page or the editing techniques in films, we describe the canvas as microergodic, as we just said. This means that we have to relate individual elements in these artifacts to each other in order to be able to make meaning. As soon as there is more than just composition, that is, some kind of exploration of textual nodes in an interactive environment, for example, but the environment does not itself change, we describe the canvas as immutable ergodic. This is the case for hypertext or dynamic infographics, and also uh, by, with museum exhibits, whose spatial arrangement, for example, has to be recognized and followed by the visitors. But it doesn't change during this visit. The third and even more complex category is the one of mutable ergodic canvases. These are video games or cybertext, where the reader, viewer, user may change the organization or content of the artifact. And interestingly, as we said in the beginning, traditional face-to-face -face interaction that do not use such complex media are also mutable ergodic, because they are constructed dynamically by the participants. This overview here on the right gives a good depiction of the increasing degree of work that a reader, viewer or user has to do in order to get or create the object of interpretation. It also shows how the various canvases and communicative situations can be embedded within other, more complex and powerful canvases. On the right hand side, we also see example artifacts for each category that should give you a good orientation to categorize your own artifacts as canvases. If we now combine these distinctions with the dimensions for the interpretation we discussed before, and also add an overview of potential semiotic modes that may play a role in the respective artifacts, we get a complex systematics of communicative situations. With this overview, we should be able to categorize and characterize any communicative situation 
and the materialities it involves for all further analysis. So we see this description of the communicative situation as the first important step towards a more systematic and foundational approach to multimodality, which from now on we will take as the basis for every multimodal analysis before we start describing the expressive forms or modes and their combinations. When looking at one final example again, which we discussed already in previous lectures, we can describe this particular situation as follows. This is a dynamic, three-dimensional, fleeting situation with two participants that construct a mutable ergodic interaction situation. Since the two participants use several further media during their interaction, we might think of several sub-canvases at work, which can all put into our analytical focus. And when doing so, we need to, of course, describe these as canvases again. The tablet in this interaction, for example, might show a specific dynamic infographic, which is then a dynamic two-dimensional permanent canvas that is mutable ergodic for the observers. The written notes, in contrast, are a static two-dimensional permanent microergodic canvas that do not change themselves. Depending on your specific research question or interest, it is then possible to choose a specific analytical focus that takes into consideration the respective canvas and that starts identifying the expressive forms and their combinations in order to describe the meaning-making processes. And this is what we will discuss in further detail in the next lecture. For now, we can summarize by describing the characteristics of the communicative situation we want to analyze we achieve clarity about what constitutes the situation. This is an important step for not just describing what is being analyzed, but for picking apart the contributions of the material and the regularities for this material. With this, we can then follow the basic idea that finding out about what a material can do also gives us knowledge about for what a material might be being used. This again means that by analyzing multimodal artifacts, we gain knowledge about how to build and construct multimodal artifacts even better. And this is a very concrete aim for all sorts of communicative endeavors and the challenge to build productive and effective communication. On the basis of this broad view of complex situations, we will then focus on smaller levels of analysis, for example, on the level of the semiotic mode, in the next lecture. And in this spirit, thank you for your attention and see you for lecture four.